Happy Monday. Hope you had a good weekend. We've got a couple things today. It is our first lab today. I'm super excited. Um, you know, we'll meet in lab after class. We'll go run over to the other building, HPEC 1190. Um, we're there from 2 to 345 or so. Generally, everyone gets the lab done before they walk out. Generally. Right? It's not due until the next week. So if you don't get it done, don't sweat it. It's okay. You can finish it later. If you get there and you're just tired and you've had a long day and you want to go home, go home. That's okay. Um, if you don't come, you don't come. If you don't come and you have lots of questions from me about lab, the first one's free. Sure, I'll help. You. That's no problem. But like, if you don't come to lab and every week you have questions about the lab, I'm going to start being upset because the lab time is when I have time to sit and look over your shoulder and help you with the lab stuff. Right. But aside from that, it's your schedule. Right? You're all adults. You can figure it out. Um, generally, it's worth coming. Get the lab done, and it's right after this class anyway. So like, you're not making another drive in or anything. Just walk over there, start the lab. If you feel good, go. Great. If it doesn't feel good, stay. Ask questions. Right? Um, that's sort of a good gauge for you. So the labs are just going to be practices for we've talked about something. Now you get a chance to practice it, and I can walk around and answer questions. Um, so the lab today will be mostly Chapter 2, a little bit of stuff from Chapter 3 to make sure everything we need for the project feels good, um, and then we can go from there. So... Um, oh goodness, did I get this wrong? I might have gotten this wrong. Shoot, we need stuff from chapter four. I totally got this wrong here. Um, that's all right. Um, I promise it won't be so bad. This one is okay. we will get there for this last part, um, on 918, and we'll get it done. So don't sweat that part with the product where you can pick different types of parties to have. We'll get to it, okay? Um, I had my head the chapters out of order here, my bad. Uh, but it'll be okay, I promise. We'll talk about different types this week. Um, we'll get through probably a good chunk of it today. We'll save some for Wednesday, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Project Zero is due the 20th at 1230. The idea is I will go over my solution for it and show you, hey, this is how I solve it. Because everyone is going to approach it a little bit different. I mean, this one's pretty basic. It'll be mostly the same, but part of coding is very creative. And it's problem solving. It's taking the big problem, breaking it down into smaller and smaller and smaller steps so that a dumb computer can solve it for us. Because right? they will do exactly what we tell it to do and only what we tell it to do. Right? They're, they're not, not very creative, aside from that. Um, now, some of the, the quote AI stuff, the large language model stuff is, uh, creative is the wrong word. It is imitative. It will imitate other things. It's a prose machine. Right? It will say, hey, I've seen this sort of thing before. Here's an answer that looked good before. It'll just make crap up all the time. So um, now while it can write code and run code and, and sort of debug a little bit here, um, it, it's limited in its capability. So um, again, I'm not, not super concerned about it now. I think it'll just make people faster, which is great. And we've, we've had tools that make us faster before that didn't mean everyone lost their jobs. Like we still need developers to write things and, and that sort of interesting stuff. So um, turns out most problems that are hard to solve, the people want computer-based solutions to make them faster and easier to work with need developers because not everyone can write code. Um, so go figure. Uh, we'll, we'll see if other people can write code with AI, but I, I don't have high hopes um, for, you know, say my wife to write code. It's a very intelligent lady. I don't think she's going to go start writing code with AI just because she could. I mean, I'm sure she could figure it out, maybe, uh, but take some practice for sure. So uh, we'll see. All right, uh, so we started on that. We'll do the lab. Um, again, it's due the next week, so we should be good there. And we'll go from there. Does that sound good for the, the plan? All right, so let me start up a new project here. I'm going to go PyCharm. Now, the GitHub process that we're going to practice in lab, so you can do it for the project, right? It starts with cloning the repository. So if you go back to the assignment here, you should have a link here, project zero. And I'll, I'll give you a link to the lab. It takes you to the GitHub Classroom link. It says, hey, do you want to accept the assignment? You say, yes, you want to accept the assignment. It says it might take a minute. It takes like five seconds. You refresh. So I say, yes, I want to accept. Count to five, hit refresh, and you've got a link. This link now is your private repository that you have access to and I have access to. Right? To get the folder on your computer, you click the code button and say, open with GitHub Desktop. Yes, I want to open GitHub Desktop. 
It says, hey, do you want to clone this website? Here's a repository online. Do you want to put it here on your computer? This path here is important. Sometimes if you're on a Windows device, it puts it in OneDrive documents because Microsoft wants to have two copies of this because Microsoft owns GitHub. So they'll have the OneDrive cloud copy and they'll have the GitHub cloud copy and then we'll just think it's silly, but that's fine. It, the defaults are usually great. So all it's gonna do is make a folder here. I'll say clone. Now, when I go make my project here in PyChart, I'm gonna go uh, new file, new project. Oops, file, new project, there we go. I'm gonna pick the path. The path is important. For all the examples I'm doing for you in class, it's gonna go into our class repository. For the project, I'm gonna go find the project repository folder. So where is 1501 fall 2023 project zero, Eric Chinesky. I'm gonna pick this one. It will put it in that folder. If I put something in that folder, Git will be able to track it. Now, again, this one's for class here, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm just, I'm just gonna make this one chapter three. Chapter three. Here we go. And again, the virtual environment stuff, great. If it's a little too slow, we, we can talk about it, but it's a good habit. And I want this main PY welcome script. I want it to give me some starter codes. We'll say create. And I like this window. I only like one window open at a time. It makes life easier for me. My computer's a little slow. So again, I'm gonna ignore this repository for now. Pretend I'm using this one because I, I want everything to go to our class repository. So when you make new stuff, it says, hey, I found a Python file. I found some new stuff. Yay. And we'll go in here and like print, I don't know, hello world. Let me zoom in a little bit for you here. And give it a run. Make sure a new project runs. We get hello world. And now we see, hey, there's a bunch of stuff. Anything that's this dot idea folder, just fine. Just leave it. It's okay to have there. Git's gonna say, I found a bunch of files, right? Git's job is to watch this folder for changes to happen. New files are changes. Deleted files are changes. Changed files are changes. So we can make a commit and say, hey, here's you know chapter three started or your project zero started, or lab zero started, whatever you want to, like, whatever we're doing here, we can make a commit. Now, my local repository has it here. Oh, here's more, more junk. I don't know. More junk showed up. That's fine. It's in the idea folder. So let it go. Now, my local copy has it, but the cloud doesn't. So I have to push the changes from my computer out to the cloud. So I'm going to push. Once I've pushed, now there's no blue buttons here. I'm in sync with the cloud. So I can go say view on GitHub. It'll launch out to the website here and you can see, hey, there's a folder for chapter three or for lab zero or for project one or whatever you want to call it. And there's a main PY file. I can click it and I can see line by line by line the contents of that file. If it looks like what you're expecting, life is good. You can take this URL and turn it in for me. This URL will take you right to that file. It's fantastic. So that's the GitHub process, right? So accept the repository, clone the repository, put the project in the folder, and then you can commit and push to sync with the cloud. It's a couple steps, but we're just gonna do it every time and we'll get used to it, all right? So and we'll do that with lab. That'll be our first lab practice. I'll make sure everyone got their code in correctly. Um, now, some people will go to the GitHub website and they'll see there's an option for add a file you can upload. Please don't ever touch this. This is dirty. Uh, you should feel bad if you use this, okay? Just don't. Follow the good workflow, right? Do the clone the repository, commit and push your files because that's how Git is supposed to work. GitHub lets you do this because their cool website gives you all sorts of other features. Git itself is not made to do this, right? So we're gonna pretend this doesn't exist, right? Okay, no, no big deal, all right, uh, that's great. All right, so as we start working then, right, we see other changes. So we'll say print happy Monday, print. Uh, welcome to chapter three. Give that a run. It works. And now I go back to the GitHub client and it says, hey, this file has changed. This red thing is gone. The green things are new. Awesome. And again, it tracks it line by line by line. So you can make as many commits as you want. Commits are free. or I mean, we don't pay for the electricity, so they're free to us. Um, I'm sure it's nominal how much electricity it uses here. Um, happy Monday. We'll commit and push. Once you've committed and pushed, got it out to the cloud, it's really, really, really hard to lose it, right? Stuff will happen all the time to our computers. Bad stuff happens, I'm sorry. Um, once it's out in the cloud, it's really hard to lose. So that's the good news, okay? So commit early and commit often, right? It's good to have a lot of commits. Now, you don't need to commit like every minute. That's probably a little excessive, but you know, every little while, like once you have a nice natural pause, commit and push. Right? If it's every half hour, if it's two hours in, great. When you get a little pause here, just commit and push. So you'll keep all your progress out there. Um, that makes sense? And then we can go find it on the website 
and you can get the links here and you can turn in the links here because putting code in Canvas is awful. But it, because then you have to like open the file and download the file and open it in the projects and it's just a mess. Right? Putting code in Canvas sucks, so we're not gonna do it. We're gonna put links to GitHub repositories because GitHub is made for code. It's a good place for code to be because they designed it for code. All right. Um, yeah, so this little bit here, this ifs, we'll get to next chapter. I'm sorry I had that out of order. Um, won't be the biggest deal. Yeah. So the link here, when you say accept the assignment, makes the repository for you. The, that's what the class. I'm sorry? Oh, without using Classroom. Uh, so you just go to your profile, um, like github.com slash me, or you just like click the GitHub link in your name here, and go to repositories, and you can say you want a new repository. That's the doing it through the website. You can also make one um, directly and then send it there. It's, the, the process gets a little bit funny. So PyCharm knows about repositories. It can make projects as repositories, but then getting it into GitHub gets a little weird. So I was like starting with GitHub. So usually I would go to GitHub first, make the repository, and then clone. Um, I like that workflow. For making a repository? Yeah. So it can turn that folder into a repository, but then you need to connect it with GitHub. So that's the step. So either you tell GitHub that you have a repository you want to store there, or you tell GitHub, make me a repository, and then you bring it down. So it, either workflow can work. Um, generally, I do go about this route. Just And again, I like the GitHub flow because it's the same no matter what language I use, whether or not I'm using Python or R or C++ or C Sharp, like whatever, it's always the same on the website. And that makes me happy. Uh, so that's all. Yeah, lots of different ways to make repositories. And GitHub is just one of the hosting providers. Uh, U of M actually has like a GitLab, Git repository ser server somewhere you can use. Uh, edu or something. Let me see. Uh, GitLab. Where is it here? Oh, GitLab.eeks, right? And you can go and log in here. And um, so GitLab is another. Uh, it's designed to be like a web server that hosts these things. We have a copy of it, essentially. Sure, perfectly fine. Um, I think GitHub's great, and I don't have to worry about all this other stuff here. So just some options, right? And other people might run Git just internally in their organization because they don't want the cloud. Um, if you do like government work, sometimes you can't use the public cloud. You have to have private clouds and other sorts of nonsense. And you can pay a lot of money to get their software running locally. And sure, lots of different options. But, yeah. So Git is the main tool. GitHub is the hosting provider of that tool. All right. So we're going to talk about different types here. Um, types are really interesting. So this is all the different ways we can store information here. So we've done strings, we've done floats, and we've done its so far, right? That's about it. Now, the idea with strings, I think we talked a little bit, is that strings are just a bunch of characters, right? Do we look at characters? And they actually become numeric values. We did the stupid uh, turn them into ordinals and add numbers and uh, made fun of people who do gematria or gematria or whatever you want to call it. Okay, that's right. That was fun last week. Um, I feel a little bad making fun of people. I probably should. That's probably a good feeling to have. But, like, don't do this stupid thing. Um, all right. There we go. So we can assign values here for strings. And you can have long strings. You can have short strings. You can get the length of strings, which is really fun. You can see how long things are. Uh, this is a multi-line string. You can just continue on with slashes here, if you want to have really long strings. So some really long string here, right? We can do first line. And then after the first line, we add a slash. Second line, add slash. Third line, and so on and so on and so on, right? And eventually we can print the really long string. It's going to be a little funny. Now, the lines don't become lines here when we do these slashes here. All it does is let us go on to the next line because ideally you don't have to scroll left and right. If you wanted to go down a line, you can use the new line character, right? that escape character, new lines. We can do new lines, we can do tabs, we can do actual slashes, we can escape the quote marks I think you looked at. And if you want to quote inside of a, a string, 
the sort of fun thing here. So you can add in your own new lines. Great. Lots of different options for making those long strings. Yeah. Yes, so if it's not inside of the quote mark, Python won't know that you want a new line character. So it only treats it as a character because it's inside of quotes. So we get a special character essentially inside the quotes here. If you want to add it where? Oh, so then you could use like the raw string we looked at, right? You can say, hey, just treat this as a raw string. Don't escape anything. Or you could escape your escape character with a double slash. And then it'll say, okay, you escape a slash, you actually want the real slash. Like there's three different ways to do everything, which is kind of fun. Um, the other fun thing you can do with really long strings um, is like a multi-line string is triple quotes. And with triple quotes, now we can say first line, second line, third line, and now I print my multi-line string. I get first line, second line, third line, just as I expect here. So the multi-line strings, um, this is our follows new lines. With this one here, you add your own new lines. So the difference here is the, being the triple quotes here for the multi-line strings. Now, technically, I have a blank here because I went down a blank. So this is really the start of that. So sometimes you might show it uh, that if you want. It gets a little ugly here. So lots of different ways you might put it. This one always confuses me because they don't look lined up, but it's fine. Um, it, it should do it for us here. And now we get no extra line there, right? Because we didn't start with an extra line. So triple quotes are fun. Um, now, because strings are just sequences of characters, they're known as a sequence type here, and they all have a specific index. So the index is what position is it in in that sequence, right? So if I have, say, name equals Eric here, the first character here is at index zero. We always start with zero in almost all languages uh, because when we count sequences, we start with zero. There's lots of reasons, we'll get into it later. Uh, they don't make a lot of sense yet, but it will eventually. So if I want just my first letter here, I can say, hey, I want to print name. And then with the square braces, I would say, hey, index zero. It's the first letter at index zero, the first letter. So I'll print out just the E, right? Because that's the first letter, right? And we can print one line at a time if we wanted, because that's super exciting. Three, two, one. So zero, one, two, three, right? Gets me the first, second, third, and fourth letter. Sure. Now, if I screw this up and I say, hey, print name to four, I get, uh oh, red errors. My program crashed. Crashing your program is no fun. But that's okay. We'll, we'll get there. Eventually, we'll figure out how to avoid this. For now, we're just going to be sad and then we'll fix it. Um, so it says string index out of range. So the index here was four. It's out of range. There is no index four, right? My length is four because there's four letters. But there is no index for it because we start at index zero. So we get zero, one, two, three. That's all. Uh, excuse me. All right. Uh, so you can do strings, length. Yeah, so getting different letters out of the alphabet. So if I wanted to have an alphabet here, I'll just copy paste that because I want to type it myself. If I wanted to print Eric, I can print alphabet index of four is an E, comma, alphabet. Index of, oh goodness, what is R? Is that a 19 or something like that? It's probably close. Alphabet. Index of I is going to be 9, I think. And then alphabet index of 2 should be the C. I'm just guessing here. It'll probably come out wrong, but we can adjust it as we go. Oops. Uh, index out of range. No index 4. I'm just going to comment that out so that it doesn't error next time because I want the rest to run. There we go. E, T, J, C. Okay, we're close. So J is one too far, so I need eight. And then T is two too far, so I need 17. Does that make sense? All right, I'm just getting close, and then I can adjust. Now I get Eric. Super exciting. All right, so with a string, you say, give me the letter with the value at this index, because this is a sequence. We get individual characters out. 
Later, we'll do all sorts of fun stuff with strings and indexes and, and sequences and that sort of fun stuff. Right now, not quite as fun. All right, uh, well, that's okay. All right, so get indexes, uh, alphabets. So changing string values. So you can't change the value inside of a string. It doesn't work like that. But you can change the entire value. So I can say, hey, if I want an alphabet this way, now I can change the value of alphabet to be lowercase alphabet. Just go copy paste that. Pick into any other examples here, but that's okay. Right? So I can change what alphabet stores. So strings are known as immutable. Are immutable. They can't change. No, nope, can't change. Did I spell that wrong? Immutable. Come on. Immutable. They can't change. What I can do is give it a different value. You can change its entire value. So I can't change the string uppercase alphabet. But I can say alphabet, you no longer are this value. Here's a new value for you entirely. So I haven't changed this string. I made a new string and told alphabet it now is this value. So uh, behind the scenes, what happens when you tell Python you want this alphabet? Python goes out to the operating system and says, hey, I need a place to store 26 characters. And your operating system says, sure, here's some location in memory. You can put something here. Now, Alphabet knows that location in memory and references that location in memory, right? It points to that in memory. You can't change what's there now because strings are immutable. But if you want to make it to be a new string, where Python says, oh, hey, operating system, I need a new place to store 26 letters. Now I want to point to that new place. So we've changed where we're looking here, and that's okay. Other than that, strings are immutable. Um, you can concatenate strings. We did that with some of our outputs, right? Um, you just smush them together, just concat. It doesn't actually add them. It just sticks them end to end. And that's concatenation here. Uh, cool. So string formatting. Um, the formatted string is super common, this F string here. These are really fun. I like formatted strings. So if we had some sort of um, value we want to put in here. So if we had, um, how about a favorite animal is an input of enter your favorite animal and favorite station spot is an input of your favorite station spots. And then we need name too, we'll get name. Name is input for your name. We get a bunch of different things. Like I say, print name, comma, apostrophe S, names, favorite animal, and animal is, and then we can comma separate the favorite animal, and then, and they like to vacation. Like, this can get a little long here, but that's okay. Um, at favorite vacation spot, sure. We can print all that out, and that would work. So enter your name, Eric, favorite animal is cat, and Disney is my favorite vacation spot. Eric's favorite animal is cat, they like to vacation at Disney. Sure, oh, I've got too many spaces here, but that's okay. Looks a little ugly. Well, this is kind of long. So it'd be nice if we could condense this. If we just wanted to just put all of these things into the string, you can do a formatted string. A formatted string says, if you have a variable, you can use curly braces and put it right into your string here. Um, let's see. So I'm going to do this in double quotes because I want to use an apostrophe here. Favorite animal. Favorite animal is. And then just another set of curly braces. Favorite animal and they like to vacation at favorite vacation, oops, favorite vacation spots. Great. Now, not too much different here at this point, right? But I don't have to have the commas. I don't have to comma separate things. And now I can just sort of read, right, as the string here, here's the variables that go in. Here, I'm just going to substitute in, I'm going to format in those variables. Right, so Derek, Cat, and Disney. And this one looks a little bit nicer. Just right, we don't have the extra the extra spaces here, and we can deal with that if we want. Right, we can take name plus favorite vacation, favorite animal is, 
right? But now we're kind of like mixing and matching, and it gets a little ugly. Cat and Disney. Okay. Um, pretty close. Oh, like two. They like two. I missed the word two. Like two vacation app. Okay. That should probably match now. But then you're going to take out the space. So it's more work to have to match it perfectly doing the comma separated outputs versus a formatted string. I just plug it right into my string with this substitution syntax. I say, hey, here's some curly braces. Please substitute this. That's all. Um, so formatted strings are really nice. And the other cool thing is you can add in numbers. It'll format numbers for you as well. So if we wanted to do that, like salary calculator, right? We said, hey, how much do you make per hour? So we'll have a I don't know, hourly wage. It's probably a float of an input of your hourly wage, right? We can figure that out and then we'll say hours worked, right? It is probably, it's probably a float again, right? You can work fractions of hours um, and actually you should get paid for them. I believe to the nearest 15 minute mark, like quarter of an hour, enter your, enter number of hours worked. Right. Then we can print here. You made, and now inside the curly braces, notice it didn't light up now except for at the F. Hourly wage, hours work times hourly, uh, hourly wage, sure. You can do arithmetic right in these format strings. Or your gross pay is, right? Gross pay is, right? You can throw that right in the format which is nice. You can do arithmetic with the comma separated stuff too, but formatted strings are pretty nice and they handle uh, at Disney. And so let's say like 15 bucks an hour for 10 hours, right? It does the arithmetic for us right in there, which is kind of fun. Um, let's see, so that's formatted strings. Other cool things you can do, um, let's see, where is it here? You can format specifically, so right here you can do some rounding. So you can say, hey, this is a string value, here's a decimal or an integer value here, here's a binary value, sure, here's hexadecimal if you care, here's exponential notation, fixed point notation, which is how many decimal places I want. This is the most common one. We say like 0.2f, because you want two decimal places to show. That's pretty common here. So if we want to round this to pennies here, we'll say colon 0.2f. Don't memorize that. It's not worth having in your head. Just go look it up. But this will give you two decimal places worth. So if I say, hey, uh, at Disney. So if it's like 11.3 and I worked 19.9 hours, it's going to round for me. Right? Really nicely. You'll take care of the rounding. I don't know. What, what does that number actually work out to be? 11.3 times 19.9. Oh, all right, it did come out perfectly. But if we had more decimal places, it would round. Um, it would round for us, which is nice. So if you don't like having those exact numbers, like if you take a third, you get 0.3333333, you can round it with this output, this formatted string here, which is really fun. And if you want to have leading digits, like if you want everything to come out to a nice even, hey, this is always a three-digit number, even if you have zero, one, two, three, whatever, you can have leading digits here, which is nice. Uh, so formatted strings are really helpful. I try and use them all the time, because when I'm outputting things, it makes life easier. Is that a question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Yes. F is selling it, it's a formatted string. If you don't have the F here, the stuff in curly braces is like, oh, I'm just gonna stick, put it out as text. If you have the F there, it says, hey, I'm gonna pretend curly braces mean you want to substitute something in. And every time I see curly braces, I will sub in a value. We rarely ever print curly braces. So this is really handy. Like, you, you, I don't know the last time I've ever had to print one of these characters, right? So it's a pretty nice, sorry, that chair's really squeaky, a nice like, substitution character to use here. Okay, so we can format things. So this is nice to get some specific outputs. All right, now we're gonna to move to other sequence types, which is fun. So a list here is a container or a sequence type. And you can put a bunch of things in a list. So here's like some list here. You just say equals set of square braces. This is an empty list. 
you can put things in at the start if you want. So you can say, hey, here's a list of, how about, uh, I'll do my kids' names. So I have Joy, I have Deb, I have Vivi. Uh, she's actually Genevieve with the J, but she goes by Vivi. I have Journey. Oops, wrong key. Um, Journey. I have Jubilee. I have Jackson. And I have Jasper. And I got seven kids. So I put all of them in a list here. And then we can print some list. Sure. Or because this is a sequence type, I can say, hey, print some list of three. Three is index three. This is index zero, index one, index two, index three. I'll get journey back out. Eric, Pat, Disney, one, one. There we go. So here's the list. It prints out like it looks. Right? In the square races, comma separated. Now, notice I get single quotes for strings. It doesn't really matter, but I gave it double, so it doesn't care. And then I get just journey out because that is index three. Right? So you can... Get values by index, just like strings. So you can get values by index, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's basically like an array, if you've worked with other languages. So it's a dynamic array, a resizable array, if that makes any more sense. I'm sorry? Uh, you can use basic type arrays, but they're obnoxious to do. Uh, next semester, we get into that a little bit, and I just say, don't bother, because it's a waste of our time. Uh, if you want to really optimize something, you can use specific array sizes. Uh, lists are ever so slightly slower. At this class, we don't care about it. Next class, we're like, eh, sure. Um, and when you get to the data structures and algorithms analysis, then you care about speed. So it takes like three semesters till we actually care about making things fast. So for now, we just, it doesn't matter. Um, so. I don't think there's any benefit of using a basic array versus a list. Uh, I think lists are always better and easier uh, for us. Yep. All right, so I can get things by index here. And all that does is say, hey, I'm going to put a bunch of things into a list. And then that list will point to those things here. So uh, lists let you do funny things here, too. So I can say uh, crazy list here is equal to, uh, what did they have, like a 1, a 2.5, and a 10, like in quotes. You can have any different kind of value in here that you want. Now, the weird thing is, though, if I'm going to print, like, hey, how about um, crazy list index of 0 times crazy list index of 2? Now, let's make this 10, right? You can do that because Python says, sure, I will try and multiply here. Might work here, so let's try this again with uh, index one and index two. Remember, you can t multiply a string by an integer, and Python says that's fine. It's Python weird like that. But now you get 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, you get the string that many times. Sure. Um, but this one now, you get can't multiply sequence by non int type of float. You can't multiply a string by a float because it doesn't know what is half of a string. Yeah, and it just pukes on you. So it doesn't always work. So putting a bunch of different values in lists can be weird. Um, oftentimes, people like to make lists homogenous and say, I'm only going to put integers in, or I'm only going to put floats in, or I'm only going to put strings in. That's an option. Uh, but Python lets you do crazy things. So lists have different types, right? Where this list, it was all strings, right? It was easy because it was all strings. Um, now, lists are mutable, so you can go change values at lists here. So if I wanted to change VV to Genevieve, the way it should be spelled, or her full name here, I can say, hey, list index of 2, I want to assign a new value. So I can change the value at index 2 specifically and say, hey, that's Genevieve here, Genevieve with a J. And I can print some list, and the list is changed. So lists are mutable. So I can't change the value here. I can't change the characters here, but I can say, hey, you point to a new location. So Python, go give me a new string in memory here, and list index 2, go point to that new location. Uh, Eric, Pat, and Disney, 1 and 1. All right, there we go. So now we see it swapped Genevieve in for BB, and now all my kids have J names, which is fun. They're the fourth generation of Js, so... Uh, eventually, we're going to start running out of J names. I don't know if they're going to keep it up or not. All right, so this one fails. Uh, can't multiply 
string via float. So I will just comment this out here. I, I don't want it to keep erroring as we go. Um, but cool, so we can change those. Um, strings, sure, why not? Updating list elements, yep, we can update the values. So other things we can do with strings are we can use these methods here. So you can remove a thing by value, or you can pop something by index, or you can append and add it into the end, which is fun. So if I have a list, say, of numbers here, numbers is a, maybe a list of one, two, three, four, five here, okay? Now I can take numbers and I can append another number. I, I can append a six. Now append will put it at the end. Think that makes sense when you append something, it goes to the end here? So add to the end. So if I were to print numbers, lowercase n numbers, append and then print numbers, great, we can do that. And then I can take numbers and I can say I want to remove the value four, right? Remove by value, it goes and removes the four. Now a list can have multiple of the same value if you want. You can have four, 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 four. Sure. When you call remove, it'll remove the first match. So it'll only remove the first four. Here. Yeah. And then maybe we want to say numbers dot pop by index here. Let's remove index four. Um, pop removes by index value, not value value. And does that make sense? Like removes by the index, not by a matching value here. And I'll print numbers. Now it should be a number four at index four because I have a bunch of them here. But let's maybe do like one, move that one. Eric and Pat and Disney, I guess those answers don't matter, right? There we go. So we have one, two, three, four, 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 five. We appended the six, we removed a four, and we popped index one, which was the number two. So you can play with the list, you can add things, you can remove things from the list, you can do all sorts of fun things here. If you want, you can even insert something at a specific location. So I could say, hey, I want to take my numbers, I want to insert. And insert says, hey, what location do you want this to be? What index do you want this value to be? So, hey, let's put it at index three. I want to put the number 27. So it inserts something at this index. Something to be the new index, or new value value at that index. So everything else gets shifted. Else shifts. So it like makes a hole there in index three. Everything else after three and beyond gets bumped down. And now this gets put into that new number three spot, index three spot. So now we should see a 27 in there. There we go. Right? This is index three, right? This is index zero, index one, index two, index three. We put in the 27. So lists are mutable. You can play with them. You can add to them. You can subtract from them. Yeah. The number what? So insert says what index do you want this to be at? And the next value is what do you want to put there? So I want to put a 27 at index 3. Let's value 27 at index 3. So it just adds this thing to that location. So lists let us do a lot of fun things. You can you can modify them, you go crazy with them. Other cool things you can do with lists, you can find the minimum value in a list. You can find the maximum value in the list. You can get the sum of the list. You can get the index of a particular value. You can get the count of how many times that value shows up in a list. So I could say, as a formatted string here, the smallest value in the list is min of, of numbers. And how about the largest value? And how about the sum? Um, and how about, I don't know, let's do a couple, min, max. Zero. So average we have to divide by the length. There's no automatic formula, which drives me crazy, but there should be, yeah. The sum, so we'll do average ourselves, average. So sum is sum, average is sum divided by the length of numbers, right? I kind of skipped over length earlier. I showed it, it was in the Zybooks. You get the length of something, how many items are in this list. So if there's 10 numbers in the list, sum them up, divide by 10, we get the average. Eric, cat, Disney, one, one, there we go. 
So minimum value is 1, max is 27, sum is 62, average is 6.2. There must be 10 numbers in the list, right? Is that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10? Look at that, it worked. Average is 6.2. How fun. Okay, so you can calculate the average yourself here. It just takes a little bit of work. Um, length, yeah, min, max, sure, stats. How does length work? So lists know how many items they have. So length will tell you how many items are in that list. And it works for sequence types, any sequence type. So strings will tell you how many characters are in that string, tell me how many items are in a list. And when we get to tuples, it'll do the same thing there. Uh, Python knows this behind the scenes about lists. It tracks it. Yep. Yeah, anything you want, you can store. So we can even ask the user here, like, let's um, I'll make a, a scores. Say scores equals a list. And we can say um, scores.append, a int of an input of enter score. Now, this is really tedious here, but I'm just going to copy paste and let's enter five scores. Right? Sure. Now, this is just a shortcut, doing it all in one line that gets to be a little funny looking. If you like it longer here, you can have it, uh, uh, value is an int of an, or we'll say score, right? is an int of an input of enter a score. And we can say scores.append score. Right? If you like two lines, fantastic. If you like one line, fantastic. Either way, we'll get the same job done, right? This is two lines, uh, single line, right? Either one, we're adding a score. How are we gonna do it here? So we'll add five scores, right? Then we can do the min-max average of the scores, right? Which is fun. So this will give us some like test results, maybe. We'll say scores. Make sure you copy paste all of them Nicely here. So that was double click to copy, control C, control V to paste, double click to highlight the whole word, replace. Let me use it on my shortcut. Sorry. I know sometimes it looks crazy. All right. So let's give it a run. Oops. I didn't want debug. That was the wrong button. Uh, oh, debugging is fine. We'll be in debug. We can see the variables, which is fine. Eric and uh, Cat and Disney. So if I go over to variables, oh, I didn't pause. Shoot. Uh, let's see. So we'll, uh, we'll pause it over here. I'm going to come over to the line number and click on it. That adds a breakpoint. Did we look at this last week? I think we did once. No? Right, so it'll, it'll pause running, and it will show me the value of everything. Which gets to be interesting when we're starting to deal with input. Um, so are they weighed? One and one. Enter a score. Okay, so let's enter some scores. What scores do you guys want? 100. Easy. All right, so now it pause. Once it gets to this line number, it pauses. This is debugging. This is the debugger in our development environment. This is why these things are amazing. So it stopped here and says, hey, I'm ready to run this line here. Here's all your variables and their values. So I can see all these different things here. So here's scores right now. Scores is empty. I can try and expand it, and there's nothing in it. Some list here says, hey, here's a bunch of things. The length is 7, by the way. Like it's telling me these sorts of values here, which is fun. Um, to run that line of code, we use the step over. So most of the time we're going to step over. Eventually we get into step into. Uh, and, and we'll step out later. So step over says run this line of code. And it goes to the next line. Now it looks like nothing's happening because it's waiting for more input. So we do like 95. Now we get this line. Then I can step, go to the next line, enter a score. How about 90? Step, go to the next line. So this is a little tedious here. So we'll just keep on going here. We'll go back to about 85. I'm going to say resume. It says stop doing this line by line by line. Just keep running here because I've, I've lost interest. So we'll do 80. There we go. So Smallest value is 80, largest value is 100, sum is 450, average is 90. I think that checks out to the other stores. So debugging lets you see the values kind of as you're going here, which is really fun. Uh, so it gets to be more interesting when we can do things based off of the user's input here. Now again, you might not always have five scores. So I've got 10 of you in the class, so I could like enter 10 scores and then I could calculate all the averages here. I can, Canvas does it for me, though, thankfully. I don't, I don't have to manually calculate anything. Canvas will give me all the fun stats, highs and lows and averages and, and whatnot. So um, that's fun. All right. So that's lists. It's a lot. There's a lot of things happening here. So you use the variable for the list, like scores dot, 
and the dot gives you all the different things you can do. You can sort it. There's other fun things we can do with lists we'll get to later. There's a whole chapter just on lists. We can get to lists and dictionaries when we get to chapter eight. We'll do more things lists. So for now, we're just, we're starting, right? Just some basics. You okay so far? All right. Tuples or tuples. I don't know if there's a right way. Tuple or tuple. Um, the same thing. doesn't matter. It's essentially a list, but it is immutable. You can't change the values in it. So sure. So I can have, this is maybe um, about, what do we want to have that is immutable? How about classes? It, now, tuples use parentheses. Drives me crazy. I don't know why, but that's fine. So you have CIS 1501. You have CIS 2001. You have CIS 350. You have a bunch of other is it IMSE. 317 or something like that. You get, um, you get a bunch of math classes, right? Which, which one is Calc? Is that 170 or something like that? Or I forget. I don't know all the numbers. You'll get a bunch of classes eventually. Now you can do the same thing. You can get the length. You can get values out by index here. You can print you know, classes at index 2 or 3. Sure, right? We should be able to get our IMSE 370. You just do this and execute selected code. There we go. I don't have to run through the rest. We get the value at index three, right, which is the fourth value. But what you can't do is change. So I can't say classes at index three is equal to, uh, what is it, probability, probability and statistics with calculus. That's, I don't know why this is not a math class. I don't understand why the IMSE department teaches this instead of math, but sure, um, I didn't make the rules. So this is going to fail. It's even telling us here, we see tuples don't support item assignment. It's warning us. It's going to let us run it here, but then it's going to crash on us when we try and execute. Now we get tuple object does not support item assignment. The thing it warned me about. You can't change values, right? Because tuples are immutable. Oops. Tuples are immutable. You can't change uh, values. Immutable. Is it just one M? No? See that? Why am I getting it wrong? Immutable. That's what I have. Uh, yeah. If you don't want it to change. So if you have a fixed set of values, you might want to use a tuple because it's really easy to change things by mistake. Right? Like I might try and, I don't know, like, uh, I, I don't know, I changed Vivi's name here. Maybe you don't want to let yourself change it. So this stops you from doing it, like, by code. So just a, for protection, um, a lot of times when we're dealing with a bunch of values, you might give them as a tuple so someone doesn't change the values before doing a bunch of arithmetic on them. You got some choices. It doesn't make a lot of sense right now. Once we do more things, we'll see why tuples are fun. Um, yeah, other than that, they do the same thing. You can make named tuples, sure. Um, I, I'm not fond of this, but you can. Uh, I don't know. I, I think this is super weird. So I would not bother with this. I think this is just nonsense. But you might see it somewhere. Yeah. Just to remember, the variable of insert just puts an object and makes it to the parent. Tell me again. It just creates a new object in the index that one way. So, yeah. So when you say, hey, I want to change the value at this index, um, like here. Python goes out and says, hey, operating system, I need to store this new value somewhere. The operating system says, here's your spot in memory. And then this location at the index now points to that new spot in memory. The old location, the old value is no longer pointed at. Behind the scenes, it can do the garbage collection and say, hey, this memory is no longer used. You can have it back. So if your Python code has millions of strings, it's going to take up a lot of memory. If you no longer need some of those strings, part of that process, this garbage collection says, I don't need all of these other strings. You can have that memory back for the things operating system. That's more of the fine details that we just kind of hand wave away right now. Um, but yeah, so that all happens because it points to these locations. They reference them is our, our term for that. So that's some of the, some of the pictures it had you know, in that uh, list as well. So your list says, hey, index zero points to this. Index one points to this. Index two points to this. These are all somewhere in memory. We don't care where these things are in memory. They're just somewhere. We don't have to care. The operating system told Python had this. Yeah. All right. Um, 
yeah, the named tuples, I, some people might use them, so like know that it exists, but this is really awkward to do these sorts of things. Um, I'm not, not fond of those at all. Uh, let's see, so then sets. Now sets are a little bit different because a set is unique. You can't have duplicates, so you can't have four, 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 four in a set, right? So if you're dealing with values that you need unique indexes or unique values only, you can use a set. So you can make sets with the set keyword and then give it a list, or you can make sets with curly braces. Sure. Um, either way will work for you. Again, fine. Uh, that's okay. So you can remove, you can pop, right, to sets. There is no insert. So when you have a set, there's no order guaranteed, which is interesting with sets. So with the lists and tuples, there was always the order. The first thing is the first thing. The second thing is the second thing. With a set, you lose that guarantee. Um, so pop will just remove a random element from the set. So pop is silly when it comes to sets. It's like, why would I remove a random thing? That's not very useful. Um, you can make sets. Um, if you like these sorts of, um, it's like a special term for this arithmetic. You can do intersections or unions or differences or symmetric differences between sets. I forget what these are all called. Um, set theory operations, sure. Set theory operations, of course. Um, they can be interesting. We're not going to bother with any of those. Just know you can do it later. All right, that's sets. All right, this is getting a little crazy. Uh, we're running a little low on time. We've got lab coming up, and we want to save some of this for Wednesday as well. So I think we're going to save dictionaries for Wednesday. Um, these get to be a little bit more complex, so we'll just wait on those, and we'll get to these other ones as we go uh, with conversions and stuff. So let me turn on some of these labs here. So we need list basics. We can do set basics. Sure. Come on. There it goes. And yeah, these other ones are fine. These are all pretty quick ones, some nice quick practices. Yeah, the simple statistics is fun. All right, cool. so I'll turn all those on. So we're gonna break in a minute. We're gonna head over to lab over in HPEC 1190. We'll work through a practice exercise. In lab, you're welcome to work together. Perfectly fine. Now, work together does not mean you do the first part, I do the second part, and then we give each other the code. Working together means we talk to each other and help each other write the code, but we write our own code. Is that, is that fair? Okay, because if you're only doing half of it and getting half, you didn't actually do the lab. Like, the idea is it's practice for you. So if labs go well, you should feel pretty confident going into the projects. If you struggle with labs, the projects are gonna be like crazy then. So the idea is labs feel good, and you get all your questions answered and you're comfortable with the material, right? You've heard me say it, you've done it in the Zy books, you've read it in the Zy books, you practice in the lab, and then you get the project. It's like the fifth time you've seen this material. By the time number five, hopefully it, it feels okay. It's still gonna be a little tricky because it's all new stuff and that's okay, but you've seen it a bunch. That's sort of the idea. Um, so ideally you're done with lab, you walk out, whatever you're done, you're done, you can leave. Like you don't have to stay to the end. Um, so labs are for your benefit. That's your time where I can walk around and answer the questions. And I give you a sample, a little sample exercise. That's sort of the goal. Um, does that make sense? All right. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns? Okay, cool. So we'll, we'll pick up this flow um, pretty much every week from now on out um, to the end of the year. Um, believe it or not, at the end of this week, we'll be 20% of the way done. And actually even further than that, because if you look at our schedule here, we have final project work time the last week and then final project presentations. So like we only had 14 weeks of content. Once we get through three weeks of it, you know, three out of 14, whatever that fraction is, sure. Um, we're doing pretty good. And one of those weeks is also the midterm review. There's nothing new there. So there's only really like 13 weeks of content. So three out of 13, like we're really getting there already. Um, it's gonna fly by as we go. So we just keep cruising chapter by chapter by chapter. I'm not going to check on your Zybooks progress because it's a lot of work for me and I don't really care to do that and enter a bunch of different Zybooks scores. You should be keeping up with it every week. If not, I'm never going to notice, but please do try. You don't want to have to do a bunch of Zybooks work when you have other final projects, final exams to study for. It's a real bad place and it's for your practice, right? So 
the more you write code, the better you're going to get at it. I know the Xi Labs are really particular and obnoxious, so hopefully they went relatively well for you here. Um, I, I did leave this one hidden because we didn't need more extra practice with that. So uh, I'm going to go back to this view here. I think I thought I got a view where I would see the percentage complete, but that's okay. Um, I must have messed something up. Content Explorer? That's not it. Whatever it is, uh, that's okay. So keep up with the practice. Is this what it is? No. Well, that's fun. This is a fun view. I thought it gave me percentages. That's fine. Um, thoughts, questions, concerns? All right, so we got a little while. We'll meet up in half an hour over in HPEC 1190. We'll do a first exercise. I'll walk you through all the GitHub stuff. Again, you'll accept the assignment, you clone the repository, you make the project in the new folder, and then you commit and push. So you have to do the first three steps. So you'll need the GitHub desktop tool, um, and we should be off to the races. Okay? Awesome. I'll see you folks in a little while.